Livy, Book 33, 1. Such were the events of the winter. At the beginning of spring, Quinstius summoned Attalus to Alatia, and wishing to bring under his control the Boeotians, who, to that point, had been wavering in their sympathies, set off through Phocis, and established his camp five miles from the Boeotian capital of Thebes. The next day he proceeded on his march to the city, taking with him the soldiers of a single maniple, along with Attalus and the numerous deputations that had come to him from all parts. But he had previously ordered the Hastati of a legion, numbering two thousand men, to follow him at a distance of a mile. At about the halfway mark of his journey, he was met by Antiphilus, praetor of the Boeotians. The rest of the population was watching the arrival of the Roman commander and the king from the city walls. Around these two could be seen only the odd weapon and a few soldiers. The Hastati, who were following at a distance, were hidden by the winding roads and valleys separating the two detachments. As Quinctius approached the city, he proceeded at a slower pace as though to greet the crowd coming from the city to meet him, though in reality he was delaying to allow the Hastati to catch up. Since a crowd of people had been massed before the lictor, the townspeople did not catch sight of the column of soldiers that was speedily following before it arrived. At the commander's quarters, at this point, they were all taken aback, suspecting that the city had been betrayed and captured through the treachery of their praetor, and Tiphilus. The Boeotians now seemed to be left with no opportunity for open discussion at the council, which was scheduled for the following day, but they concealed their chagrin, which they would have displayed to no purpose, and not without risk to themselves. 2. At the council, Attalus was the first to speak. He opened with an account of the various services rendered by his ancestors and by himself both to Greece as a whole and to the people of Boatia in particular. But too old and frail, now to cope with the stress of public speaking, he fell silent and collapsed. The meeting was temporarily suspended, while they carried the king out and tried to bring him round. He had suffered a partial paralysis. Thereupon, Aristinus, praetor of the Achaeans, was given the floor, and he had all the more impact because the advice he had for the Boeotians was no different from what he had given to the Achaeans. A few remarks were added by Quinctius himself, lauding the dependability of the Romans rather than their military strength or material resources. There followed a motion proposed and read aloud by Dicaricus the Platian regarding the establishment of a pact with Romans, and since no one presumed to speak against it, this was accepted and carried by the votes of all the city-states of Boeotia. When the council broke up, Quinctius stayed on in Thebes only as long as he was obliged to by Attalus' sudden affliction.
when it emerged that it had not been a life-threatening attack, but one which had disabled him, the consul left him there to undergo the requisite treatment and return to Elatia, his point of departure for Thebes. He had now enlisted the Boethians as allies, as he had earlier the Achaeans, and with territory to his rear, now left secure and pacified, his entire attention had been brought to focus on Philip and what remained of the war. 3. Philip, too, was active at the beginning of spring. When his delegation returned from Rome with no peace settlement, he proceeded with a muster of troops throughout all the towns of his realm. Since he faced a severe shortage of younger men, uninterrupted warfare over many generations had reduced the Macedonian population, and during his own reign, too, large numbers of men had fallen in wars fought at sea against the Rhodians and Attalus, and on land against the Romans. Accordingly, he began to enroll recruits from the age of sixteen, and men whose service was over, but who still possessed a modicum of strength, were also recalled to service. With his army brought up to strength in this manner, Philip assembled all his troops at Diem after the spring equinox. There he established a base camp and began his wait for the enemy, drilling his men every day. At about this time, too, Quinctius left Elatia and passing by Thronium and Scarfea, came to Thermopylae. He was detained in the area by an assembly of the Aetolians convened at Heraclea, at which members were discussing the number of auxiliary forces they would take when they followed the Romans to war. Learning the decision of the allies, he advanced from Heraclea to Zinei, Two days later, pitched camp on the Ionian Thessalian border and waited for his Aetolian auxiliaries. The Aetolians wasted no time, and 6,000 infantry and 400 cavalry arrived under the command of Phineas. To leave no doubt about what he had been waiting for, Quinctius immediately struck camp, passing into Pythia. Oh, fuck. Like, really? P T H I O T I C. Passing into Thyotic territory. I'm going to assume the P is silent. Passing into Thyotic territory, he was joined by 500 Gortanians. That's spelled G O R. T-Y-N-I-A-N-S. Okay, from time to not time, I'm going to spell out these names, which just, to me, at times, they just seem ridiculous. Uh, through translation, transliteration, they just, they're, they're, ugh. Anyway, but, whatever. <laughs> That's, who am I to say? We'll just keep plugging on here. Passing into Thyotic territory, he was joined by 500 Gortinians, again spelt G-O-R-T-Y-N-I-A-N-S, from Crete, under the command of Sidus, spelt C-Y-D-A-S, and 300 similarly armed troops from Apollonia, and not much later by Aminander, spelt A M Y N A N D E R. Looks like I'm going to be spelling all night with 1,200 Athamanian, A-T-H-A-M-A-N-I-A-N infantry. On learning that the Romans had left Elatia, Philip felt he should give encouragement to his men, facing as he was a decisive struggle. After a long harangue, on the time-worn themes of their ancestors, 
glorious exploits and the military reputation of Macedon, he then came to the items which were at the moment striking terror into them and those which could inspire them to some degree of hope. 4. To counterbalance the defeat suffered in the gorge at the river Aos, spelt A-O-U-S, Philip referred to the route inflicted on the Romans on land at Atrax by the Macedonian phalanx, and even at the Aos, he said, where the Macedonians had failed to maintain their grip on the passes of Epirus, which they had seized, responsibility lay primarily with the men who had been negligent in guard duty, and after that, in the battle itself, with the light-armed and mercenary troops. The Macedonian phalanx, he claimed, had stood firm on that occasion, and would always remain invincible in pitched battle on level ground. Philip's phalanx comprised 16,000 men and represented the essence of the kingdom's strength. He also had 2,000 soldiers carrying small shields, men known as peltasts, and an equal number, that is, 2,000 from each nation. Of Thracians and Illyrians, these later coming from a tribe called the Trales, spelled T-R-A-L-L-E-S. There was also an assortment of some 1,500 mercenary auxiliaries of various nations, and 2,000 cavalry. Such were the troops with whom the king was awaiting his enemy. As for the Romans, they had roughly the same numbers. Only in cavalry were they superior because of the Aetolian supplement. 5. Quinstius had now moved his camp to Thyotic. Thebes. Here he entertained the hope of the city being delivered to him through the intrigue of Timon, a leading citizen of the community, and so he came up to the walls with only a few cavalry and light infantry. His hopes were dashed, however, to such an extent that he faced not only a battle with counteracting forces, but danger that might have been critical but for the timely arrival of his infantry and cavalry, which had been speedily called to action from the camp. When his incautiously conceived hopes came to nothing, Quinstius put a temporary halt to his efforts to take the city. Well aware, however, that the king was already in Thessaly, but with no information as yet on the area into which he had come, he sent his men through the fields with orders to cut and prepare palisade stakes. The Macedonians and Greeks also used stakes, but they did not modify their practice so as to facilitate transportation of them or strengthen their defense capability. They would cut down trees that were too big and had too many branches for a soldier to be able to carry them in addition to his weapons. And when they had formed a circle of these around their camp, breaking down the palisade was easy. This was because the trunks of the trees rose from the ground at wide intervals, and their numerous and sturdy branches enabled one to get a firm hold on them. Thus, two or at most three, young men would, after some effort, pull up one of the trees, and when it was torn out, an open space, like a doorway, was immediately created, with nothing easily available to block it. The Romans, however, cut stakes that are light and usually forked, bearing three, or at most, four branches, so that a soldier can easily carry a number of them at a time, with his weapons hanging behind his back. Further, they plant these so close together and interlace the branches so well that one cannot tell which branch belongs to a particular trunk nor, and there's a blank here, a missing piece of parchment, I assume, uh, 
and the branches are so sharpened and so tightly intertwined as to leave no room for inserting a hand, with the result that it proves impossible to grasp anything that can be pulled out, or indeed to pull anything out, since the interlaced branches bond together to form a barrier, and if by chance one stake is pulled out, the space that is left is small, and it is easy to make a replacement. 6. The following day, Quintius advanced a short distance, his men carrying with him the palisade, so as to be ready to pitch camp in any location. About six miles from Ferai, spelt P-H-E-R-A-E, he halted and sent out a scouting party to find out where, in Thessaly, the king was positioned and what he was doing. The king was in the neighborhood of Larissa. He had already been informed that the Romans had moved from Thebes to Pharaoh, and since he too wished to have done with the battle as soon as possible, he proceeded to march towards his enemy and pitched camp about four miles from Pharaoh. The next day, light infantry from the two sides went forward from their positions to seize the hills overlooking the city and when both were about the same distance from the ridge which they were to take, they caught sight of each other. They sent messengers back to camp to seek advice on what to do now that they had unexpectedly come across the enemy and halted quietly awaiting their return. That day they were called back to camp without engaging the enemy, but the following day there was a battle between the cavalry in the area of those same hills, and the king's troops were put to flight and driven back to their camp, thanks not least to the Aetolians. What seriously hindered both sides in their functioning was the fact that the countryside was covered with closely planted trees, that there were guardians, as was to be expected in districts close to the city, and that there were walls restricting the roads, and in places, blocking them off entirely. According, accordingly, the two commanders both decided to quit the area, and as if they had prior intelligence, both made for Scatuza, Philip hoping to acquire provisions from the place, and the Roman intending to get there ahead of his foe, and destroy the crops. The two armies marched an entire day without catching sight of each other at any point, because an unbroken chain of hills lay between them. The Romans encamped in Eretria, in Thyotic territory, and Philip on the river on Chestus, spelt O-N-C-H-E-S-T-U-S. The following day, Philip pitched his camp at a place called Melambium, in the area of Scatuza, while Quintius pitched his in the neighborhood of Thetadeum, in Pharsalian territory. And even at the point, neither side was certain of the location of its enemy. On the third day, there was a downpour, followed by fog dark as night, and this pinned down the Romans who were afraid of being ambushed. 7. In order to accelerate his progress, Philip gave the order to advance, undaunted by the clouds which had come down to ground level after the rainstorm. But so thick was the mist that had blotted out the daylight that the standard bearers could not see the road nor the soldiers the standards, and the column, floundering around and following indistinct shouts like people lost in the night, was thrown into disarray. After crossing the so-called Sinoscephale, spelt C-Y-N-O-S-C-E-P-H-A-L-A-E, after crossing the so-called Sinoscephale Hills, 
and leaving there a strong garrison of infantry and cavalry, the Macedonians pitched camp. The Roman commander had remained in the same encampment at Thetidium, but he did send out a scouting detachment of ten squadrons of cavalry and one thousand infantry to locate the enemy, warning them to be on their guard against an ambush, which the poor daylight would hide, even in the open. When this detachment reached the hills occupied by the enemy, each side struck panic into the other, and both froze in their tracks. They then sent messengers back to their respective commanders in camp, and after the initial alarm prompted by the unexpected visual contact had abated, they no longer held back from the fray. The fighting was first provoked by just a few men who rushed ahead of the others, but it then escalated as support arrived for defeated comrades. The Romans, no match for the enemy, sent messenger after messenger back to their commander to tell him they were under pressure. Then five hundred cavalry and two thousand infantry, Aetolians for the most part, were swiftly dispatched under two military tribunes, and these restored the flagging situation for the Romans. With the change of fortunes, the hard-pressed Macedonians now proceeded to send messages to implore the king's assistance. After the widespread darkness that had fallen, however, the last thing the king expected on that day was a battle and he had sent out a large section of his forces of every category on, the for on a foraging expedition. For a time, he was in a panic, not knowing what to do. The messages became insistent, however, and the cloud had now dissipated to reveal the hilltops, bringing into sight the Macedonians driven together on a prominence that towered above the others, and defending themselves more by virtue of their position than with their weapons. Philip thought that, come what may, he had to throw everything into the fight, so as not to sacrifice part of his army by failing to come to its defense, and he sent out the leader of his mercenary troops. Athenagoras, with all the auxiliaries, save the Thracians, along with the Macedonian and Thessalian cavalry. With their arrival, the Romans were dislodged from the hilltop, and they offered no resistance until they reached the more level part of the valley. It was support provided by the Aetolian cavalry that was mainly responsible for their not being driven off in a complete rout. These were the far the best cavalry in Greece at the time, though as far as infantry was concerned, the Aetolians were inferior to their neighbors. 8. The report of the action was more optimistic than was justified by Macedonian success in the encounter, as men came running back from the battle in waves, calling out that the Romans were fleeing in terror. But it constrained Philip to lead out all his troops to the line, reluctant and hesitant though he was. It was a reckless maneuver. And there's a uh, blank space here um, suggesting a missed part of uh, parchment. He declared, and he liked neither the locale nor the timing. The Roman general did the same, prompted more by the exigent. The Roman general did the same, prompted more by the exigencies of the situation than because circumstances favored combat. Leaving his right wing in reserve, with the elephants positioned before the standards, he attacked the enemy on the left wing with all his light infantry. At the same time, he reminded them that the Macedonians they would be fighting were the ones they had dislodged and defeated in battle at the gorges of Epirus, where 
Though the enemy had the protection of mountains and rivers, the Romans had surmounted the natural obstacles of the area. They were, he said, the ones they had defeated when they fought earlier under Sulpicius, and the Macedonians were holding the pass to Eordea, spelled E-O-R-D-A-E-A. It was a reputation, not real strength, that the kingdom of Macedon rested, he continued, and the reputation, too, had finally faded away. By now the Romans had reached their comrades, making their stand in the lower reaches of the valley, and these, with the arrival of the army and their general, renewed the fight, attacking and again throwing back the enemy. With his peltast and the infantry, right wing called the phalanx, which constituted the strength of the Macedonian army, Philip now charged his enemy almost at a run, ordering Nicanor, one of his courtiers, to follow at a rapid pace with the rest of the troops. On reaching the hilltop, Philip could see from the few weapons and enemy corpses lying around there that the battle in the spot was finished and that the Romans had been driven back, and he could also see a fight going on near the enemy camp. His initial reaction was sheer delight. Soon, however, as his own men came running back and the terror changed sides, he panicked, unsure for the moment whether or not to take his troops back to their camp. The enemy kept coming closer, and now the king's men were being cut down as they turned to run, their deliverance impossible unless they were brought support. Not only that, but there was no longer any way even for Philip himself to retire in safety. And so, although a section of his force had not yet joined him, he was obliged to risk a decisive engagement. He placed his cavalry and light infantry, who had participated in the engagement on the right wing, and having placed the peltas, he ordered the men of the Macedonian phalanx to lay down their spears, the length of these providing an encumbrance, and fight with their swords. At the same time, he took measures to prevent penetration of his fighting line. He took half of the front of the phalanx, and with that doubled depth of the formation, extending the line inwards, so that the battle line was deep rather than wide, he also ordered the ranks closed up so that men should shoulder to shoulder, stood shoulder to shoulder, and weapons were touching weapons. 9. After taking in between the ranks, the men who had been involved in the battle, Quintius gave the signal on the trumpet. Rarely, they say, has there been a war cry at the start of a battle as loud as this one. For as chance would have it, both armies shouted at the same time, and not just those who were actually fighting, but also the reservists and those arriving for the battle at that very moment. On the right wing, the king had the upper hand aided by his position more than anything else, fighting as he was from the higher hills. On the left, at that instant, the part of the phalanx which had formed the rear was coming up, and this was causing confusion and turmoil. The center, positioned closer to the right wing, was stationary, the men engrossed in watching the battle as if it did not involve themselves. The phalanx, which had arrived in the form of a column rather than a battle line, and which was more appropriately drawn up for marching than combat, had barely reached the brow of the hill. While these men were still in confusion, Quintius made his attack, first sending in the elephants against his enemy. He did this despite the fact that he could see his own men retreating on the right wing, for he surmised that if some of the enemy's forces were crushed, they would drag the rest along with them. There was no doubt about the outcome. 
the Macedonians immediately turned tail, their initial terror on seeing the beasts sending them running, and the others did indeed follow their defeated comrades. Then one of the military tribunes made an impromptu decision. Leaving behind that section of his men that clearly had the upper hand, he took the soldiers of twenty companies, made a short encircling maneuver, and attacked the rear of the enemy right wing. No battle line would have escaped being thrown into disorder by an attack from behind. But in addition to the alarm, many might feel in such circumstances there was the further problem that the Macedonian phalanx, cumbersome and unmaneuverable, was unable to wheel about, an operation that was also inhibited by those Romans, who, though earlier pulling back from the front of the phalanx, were at that moment bearing down on the terrified Macedonians. Furthermore, the latter were handicapped by their position, while chasing the defeated Romans down the slope. They had ceded the ridge from which they had been fighting to those of the enemy who had been brought around to their rear. For a short while they were cut down between the two fronts, then most of them threw down their weapons and took to their heels. 10. Taking a few infantry and cavalrymen, Philip seized a hillock higher than the others. There's a blank here suggesting a missing script. And it has been suggested that the word could be two. So we'll read it as such. Picking up again at the beginning of the sentence. Taking a few infantry and cavalrymen, Philip seized a hillock higher than the others. Two observe how his men were faring on the left flank, when he saw them in disorderly flight, with standards and weapons glinting all around the hills. Then he too quit the field. Quintius had been putting pressure on the retreating Macedonians, but then he saw them raising their spears. He was unsure of their intentions, and the straight movement suddenly prompted him to bring his troops to a brief halt. On being told that this was the Macedonian convention for indicating surrender, he had it in mind to show mercy to his defeated foes. But his men, not realizing the enemy had given up the fight and unaware of their commander's wishes, attacked them and killed those at the front after which the others scattered in flight. The king headed for Tempe at breakneck speed, and there halted at Gonai for a day to gather in any who survived the battle. The triumphant Romans, hoping for spoils, and there's another spot here suggesting the uh, missing script, and the word is suggested came into the enemy camp only to find that it had already been, for the most part, ransacked by the Aetolians. So, again, picking up that sentence with the addition, the triumphant Romans, hoping for spoils, came into the enemy camp only to find that it had already been, for the most part, ransacked by the Aetolians. On that day, 8,000 of the enemy lost their lives and 5,000 were captured, while about 700 of the victors were lost. If one can believe Valerius, who is guilty of gross exaggeration of numbers of all kinds, 40,000 of the enemy were killed that day, and 5,700 taken prisoner, a more reasonable fabrication, with 249 military standards captured. Claudius's account also gives the enemy dead as 32,000, with 4,300 taken prisoner. As for me, it is not simply a case of my accepting the lowest figures, but I have followed Polybius, no unreliable authority, on Roman history in general, and particularly on that conquered and 
again. As for me, it is not simply a case of my accepting the lowest figures, but I have followed Polybius, no unreliable authority, on Roman history in general, and particularly on that concerned with Greece. So here in 33.10, at the end, we find that uh, Livy is more partial to Polybius than he is with Valerius, who he claims exaggerates numbers. Something to keep in mind, I suppose. 11. Philip brought together the fugitives who had followed in his path after being dispersed by the various hazards of the battle, and he sent men to Larissa to burn the royal archives so they should not fall into enemy hands. He then withdrew to Macedonia. As for Quintius, he divided the prisoners of war and the booty, selling some and giving some to the men, and set off for Larissa. Though he did not yet know the area for which the king had headed or what his intentions were. At Larissa, a herald of the king came to him, ostensibly to seek a truce so that the casualties of the battle could be picked up for burial, but really to ask permission to send ambassadors. Both requests were granted by the Roman general, who added that the herald should tell the king to take heart. This was particularly vexing for the Aetolians already aggrieved and complaining that victory had altered the commander. Before the battle, he used to involve his allies in everything great or small, they said, but now these took no part in planning, and Flaminius, oh, sorry, um, let's pick up that sentence again. This was particularly vexing for the Aetolians, already aggrieved and complaining that victory had altered the commander. Before the battle, he used to involve his allies in everything, great or small, they said. But now these took no part in planning, and Flamininus did everything on his own initiative. He was, they said, seeking a way to make Philip personally grateful to him so that while the Italians would have had their fill of the hardships and tribulations of the war, the Romans, sorry, the Roman would be deflecting to himself and, oh my, again, he was, he said, seeking a way to make Philip personally grateful to him, so that while the Aetolians would have had their fill of the hardships and tribulations of the war, the Roman would be deflecting to himself the gratitude for the peace and the resulting profits. It was quite clear that the Aetolians had lost a measure of their prestige, but they had no idea why they were being ignored. They actually believed that a man whose character was not at all susceptible to such avarice had his sights set on the king's largesse. In fact, Quintius was incensed with the Aetolians, and with good reason because of their voracious appetite for plunder and their arrogance in appropriating to themselves the credit for the victory, their boast of which grated on everyone's ears. He could see, too, that with Philip removed and the power of the kingdom of Macedon shattered, it was the Aetolians who would have to be considered the masters of Greece. For these reasons, Quintius was methodically taking several measures to ensure that their standing and influence be diminished, and be seen to be diminished in every quarter. 12. The enemy had been granted a 15-day truce, and a meeting had been scheduled with the king himself. 
Before the time of that meeting arrived, however, Quintius called the allies to a conference at which he brought up the matter of the peace terms they wished to have established. Aminander, king of the Athamanians, stated his position in a few words. Peace must be arranged on such terms as rendered Greece strong enough to preserve her independence as well as to keep the peace, even in the absence of the Romans. The speech of the Aetolians was sharper in tone. After a few prefatory remarks, they said that the Roman commander's action in consulting those who had been his allies in the war on the question of peace was right and proper. But they added, he was quite wrong if he thought he would be putting peace for the Romans or independence for Greece on a secure footing without Philip being either killed or deposed. Both ends, they say, were easily attainable if he chose to follow up his success. In answer, Quintius said that the statement of the Aetolians took no account of Roman practice and was also at odds with their earlier views. In all previous councils and meetings, the Aetolians had discussed terms of peace, not fighting to the point of extermination, and the Romans, who had a long-established custom of sparing the defeated, had given a notable demonstration of their clemency in granting a peace treaty to Hannibal and the Carthaginians. But to say nothing of the Carthaginians on how many occasions had there been discussions with Philip himself, and there had never been a question of his leaving the throne. Or was it simply that war had become an unpardonable crime now that he had been defeated in battle? One should confront an armed foe with hostility, he said, but with a defeated enemy, it is the most humane victor who demonstrates the greatest character. The kings of Macedon seem to pose a threat to the liberty of Greece, he continued, but if that kingdom and that people were eliminated, Thracians, Illyrians, and after them Gauls would come pouring into Macedonia and Greece, barbarous and ferocious peoples. The Greeks, he concluded, should not tear down the states nearest to them, and thereby leave themselves exposed to others more powerful and dangerous. At this point, Phineas Praetor of the Aetolians interrupted, declaring that if Philip gave them the slip on that occasion, he would soon rise again with a more serious war. Stop your blustering when we have matters to discuss, replied Quintius. Such will be the conditions binding the king that he could not possibly start a war. 13. The council adjourned, and the following day the king arrived at the pass leading to Tempe, the venue set for their meeting. On the third day following that, he was introduced to a crowded assembly of the Romans and allies. At this, Philip very wisely conceded of his own accord all items indispensable for negotiating peace, rather than have them forced out of him in argument, and he declared that he accepted all the terms laid down by the Romans or insisted upon by the Allies at the previous meeting, and would leave all else to the discretion of the Senate. It seemed that he had now silenced all his critics, even the most hostile. But when everyone fell silent, the Aetolian Phineas said, So, Philip, are you finally returning to us Pharsalus, Larissa, Cremaste, Echinus, and Thion, Thebes? When Philip said he saw no objection to their retrieving them, an argument broke out between the Roman commander and the Aetolians on the matter of Thebes. Quintius' position was that it had fallen to the Roman people by the rules of war. Before the conflict, he said, when he had brought the army to the city, the Thebans had been 
invited to form an alliance, and, though they had the clear opportunity to break with the king, they had preferred a treaty with him over one with Rome. Phineas was of the opinion that, in the light of the alliance formed to prosecute the war, it was fair that the Aetolians be given back what they had held before the war. And he added that the terms of the original treaty had provided for spoils of the war in the form of goods and chattels going to the Romans and land and captured cities going to the Aetolians. You yourselves broke the terms of that particular treaty at the time when you left us to make peace with Philip, replied Quintius. Even if it were still in force, that clause in it would still only apply to captured cities, and the city-states of Thessaly voluntarily accepted our authority. These arguments won the support of all the allies, but for the Aetolians, as well as being unpleasant to listen to at the time, they later proved to be the cause of a war that had disastrous consequences. An agreement was reached with Philip that he give his son Demetrius and a number of his friends as hostages and pay an indemnity of 200 talents, and that he send a delegation to Rome on the other items, for which the king was granted a truce of four months. Should peace not be granted by the Senate, an assurance was given that the hostages and money would be returned to Philip. They say that the prime reason for the Roman commander's haste to make peace was that it was now certain that Antiochus was making preparations for war and for an invasion of Europe. 14. At this same time, and according to some accounts, on the very same day, the Achaeans defeated the king's general and dressed the knees in pitched battle at Corinth. Philip intended using the city as a fortress against the city-states of Greece, and after summoning the leading citizens from there, allegedly to discuss the number of cavalry, Corinth could supply for the war. He had detained them as hostages. Moreover, in addition to the earlier contingent that he had maintained in the city comprising 500 Macedonians and 800 auxiliaries of various kind, he had sent a further 1,000 Macedonians, 1,200 Illyrians and Thracians, and 800 Cretans. The Cretans were to be found fighting on both sides. Apart from these, there were 1,000 Boeotians, Thessalians, and a carning Ar oh. Excuse me, folks. Apart from these, there were 1,000 Boeotians, Thessalians, and Acarnanians, all shield bearers, and 700 men of military age from amongst the Corinthians themselves, to make a total of 6,000 men under arms, which gave and dressed the knees the confidence to decide matters in the field. Nicostratus, praetor of the Achaeans, was at Sicyon with 2,000 infantry and 100 cavalry, but since he could see he was at a disadvantage both in numbers and in the quality of his troops, he would not venture beyond the ramparts. The king's troops, made up of infantry and cavalry, were roaming around, making raids on the countryside of Pelene, Phleas, and Cleonae. Finally, they passed over into the territory of Sicyon, taunting their enemy with cravenness, and they also used their ships to sail along the entire coast of Achaea, which they routinely plundered. Since the enemy were engaged in these operations in a sporadic and, as it happens, with overconfidence, even a remiss manner, Nicostratus conceived the hope of attacking them unawares. He quietly sent messages around the neighboring states with orders for armed men to assemble at Apollorum, an area in 
Stymphalian territory and specifying the date and the numbers from each state. When the preparations for the appointed day had been made, he forthwith set off by night through the land of Phleas and reached Cleonae with nobody aware of his plans. With him were 5,000 infantry, including, and there's a missing part of parchment here, light infantry and 300 cavalry. With these forces, he began his wait, having dispatched scouts to observe the direction in which the enemy were spreading out. 15. Unaware of all this, Androsthenes set out from Corinth and encamped on the Nemea, a stream flowing between the lands of Corinth and those of Sicyon. At this point, he disengaged half his army, divided it into three parts, and ordered these and all his cavalry to conduct simultaneous raids on the farmlands of Pelene and Sicyon, and on those of Phleas. These three columns marched off in different directions. When news of this reached Nicostratus at Cleonae, he immediately sent ahead a strong detachment of mercenaries to seize the pass which afforded access to the territory of Corinth. Then, positioning the cavalry before the standards as an advance guard, he himself swiftly followed the mercenaries with his army split into two columns, the mercenary troops and light infantry marching in one, and the shield-bearers. At that time, the strength of the army for those nations in the other. By now, the infantry and cavalry were not far from the Macedonian camp, and the number of the Thracians had attacked the enemy who were roaming in disorder through the countryside, when consternation suddenly struck the enemy camp. The general panicked. He had not seen his enemy at any point apart from an occasional glimpse in the hills before Sicyon, and then they would not venture to send down their column into the plains, and he had never believed they would come to Cleonae. He gave orders for those who were scattered in various places outside the camp to be recalled with a trumpet signal, then, ordering his men to take up arms at the double, he went out through the gate with an underman column of soldiers and deployed his line of battle on the river bank. All these troops, apart from the Macedonians, could only with difficulty be brought together and put into formation, and they failed to withstand the initial assault of the enemy. The Macedonians had assembled for the fight in by far the greatest numbers, and they long kept the prospect of victory for either side in doubt. Finally left unprotected, when the others fled, and with two enemy battle lines bearing down on them from different directions, the light infantry from the flank, the shield-bearers, and peltas from the front, they too could see the battle was lost. They gave ground at first, and then, under pressure, took to their heels. Most of them threw away their weapons, and with no hope left of holding on to the camp, they headed for Corinth. Nicostratus sent his mercenaries to pursue them, and his cavalry and Thracian auxiliaries he dispatched against the troops ravaging the farmland of Sicyon, causing a great bloodbath in all quarters, almost greater even than in the battle itself. Then there were the soldiers who had pillaged Pelene and Phleas, returning to camp out of formation and unaware of all that had happened. Some of these came amongst the enemy outpost, which they took to be their own. Others suspected from the turmoil that had happened and took to flight, becoming so dispersed as to be surrounded as they wandered about even by the local peasants. On the day, on that day, 15,000 men lost their lives and 300 were captured. And all Achaea 
was delivered from a terrible dread.